time, the whole idea kind of disappeared from view for quite a while, but new evidence has just been piling in really solid scientific evidence, archaeological evidence, which supports that case. And that's why I've written this new book and I've been giving talks all over Britain, all over the United States. And, and uh, yeah, it appears to, it appears to resonate. It appears that, uh, you know, people are, are, are no longer happy with the story we've been told about our past. And we shouldn't forget that history is a, is a story. It is a narrative uh, and it's a narrative that's controlled by particular groups of individuals. And, and I think there's a, a growing awareness in our society that what authority authority figures tell us aren't necessarily true. hundred percent there is. And, and uh, I mean, the, those things that don't fit the, the orthodox uh, view of our history are simply discarded or, or suppressed because it just yeah. it presents and, and huge a, problems. And there's a very strong sense in which this, this relates to the whole mind control operation that's in effect in, in the modern world today. Uh, you know, if you have a, a grip on the past, if you control how the past is understood, then that puts you in a very strong position to control the present and to control the future. And I think that's one of the reasons why radical ideas about the past, which move away from the mainstream position, are, are so fiercely attacked because it's understood that these are subversive ideas, that if, that if um, we overturn the grip on the past that established authorities have, then this actually threatens those authorities' grip on the present as well. Uh, my uh, my beloved my, Maddie, Mighty Aphrodite, as I call her on the on the air, spends some time working as an archaeologist, and I know from her how how political it is. Uh, but it really uh, it it cuts across all of the major disciplines. How information is controlled uh, at the top. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we talk in, in terms of, you know, the medical sciences and so forth about the peer review process. But if you look yep. into how that, I mean, the same thing, the, the information is, there's a firewall uh, yep. that's been cleverly built and it doesn't take a lot of people. I don't think people understand that, you know, it doesn't take, it's not a huge military operation. It doesn't take but a few to control the flow of information. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the case. I've, I've, I've seen this again and again over the years. Working, working in this field, but I think the new, the new development, certainly for me, what's what's changed in the past twenty years is, is well, obviously I, I published Fingerprints of the Gods in 1995. It was a very different world then. We had the internet, but it wasn't strong in the way that it is today. And I think this, um, the, the growth of the internet, coupled with new scientific evidence and new discoveries that can't be explained by the old paradigm and broad awareness of those new discoveries because of the internet. I think that that really changes everything and it allows us to, you know, to consider new ways of looking at the past and new ways of moving forward. You're certainly on the, on the forefront in terms of bringing this information about ancient uh, technologically advanced civilizations uh, that survived cataclysmic events. Um, I had Janet Sitchin on, on the program. I think it was, was it last week, Albert? Janet, of course, the, the niece of uh, Zechariah Sitchin. You yeah. talked about the Anunnaki. Uh, I had um, L.A. Marzuli. I brought L.A. to town. Uh, uh, who comes at it from a, 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 di a different perspective? He's talking about, and he's been to, you know, the um, there's a, a great picture of the, uh, this uh, jigsaw puzzle of a, of a wall, a fortress in Peru. Uh, yeah, Saxe Huaman. He talks about it in terms of you know the watchers and fallen angel technology or architecture. We had um, Michael Cremo who talks about uh, how the Earth is far older in, in ancient uh, technologically advanced civilizations going back, yeah. you know, millions of years. Sure. Are you all sure. talking about the same things but using different language, coming at it from a different perspective? Mm -hmm. No, I would say that we're all talking about the same problem, which is that the present explanation of the past, the present narrative about the past that's taught in our schools and universities, that's broadly disseminated by their friends in the, in the media, that that doesn't cut it anymore. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a deep enigma uh, hidden in the past of the human race, and, and people from all different directions and all different points of view have been struck by that mystery and are seeking for explanations for it. And I think that's, I think that's healthy. I think it's healthy that we have a variety 
of ways to try to get around these anomalies in the past, these things that just don't fit what we're being told. My own position is, is, is fairly clear. Uh, I think we, we're a species with amnesia. I think we've lost uh, a very important part of the human story. I think there was an episode of advanced civilization roughly constrained between 70,000 years ago and 11,600 years ago. And this advanced civilization coexisted on planet Earth with uh, less advanced peoples, with hunter-gatherers, uh, nomadic groups of hunter-gatherers, just as our civilization does today. I mean, we have very advanced technological societies uh, all over the globe, but we also have um, l less complex societies, societies of, of hunter-gatherers and nomads in the Kalahari Desert, for example, or, or in the Amazon. And I think this was the case before. I think this, this lost advanced human civilization had contact with these uh, hunter-gatherer peoples, shared some of its knowledge with them. But the great cataclysm, which is absolutely solidly documented in science now, between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, wiped that advanced civilization out, leaving only a few survivors. And those survivors settled amongst hunter-gatherer peoples uh, and sought to rebuild civilization uh, in many interesting ways, but did not quite succeed. And we're left with this haunting memory, this, this tradition, this, this feeling of something really important, lost and locked away and hidden in our past. And the effort now is to uncover it and, and, and show the truth. Graham Hancock, Magicians of the Gods. We'll come back and continue this conversation and delve further. Welcome back. Graham Hancock is here. The book is Magicians of the Gods. Graham will be in town Sunday, December the 13th from 12 to 2 at the Bloor Hot Dog Cinema. However, the event is sold out. You are in luck, however. I have a pair of tickets uh, that uh, we will give away during the hour uh, to some lucky caller with a question or comment for Mr. Hancock. All right. Uh, Let's talk about this advanced civilization, a technologically advanced civilization, the sages, the magicians, the shining ones, as they've been called. Um, where do they come from? And, and where, I mean, is it, was it in Atlantis specifically, or were they scattered elsewhere around the world? Well, I think what, what we need to understand is that Atlantis is just one of a great many almost identical stories that are told around the world. In ancient India, for example, the lost island, the lost continent was, was called Kumari Kandam and was considered to uh, exist on a great extension of India southwards into the Indian Ocean, which was later submerged beneath the seas in a cataclysmic disaster. And it's interesting that the Indian Kumari Kandam tradition actually gives the same date, which is 11,600 years ago for the cataclysm that wiped that lost continent out, that Plato gives for the destruction and submergence of Atlantis. You know, it's common for academics to mock the Atlantis story and, and to treat it as though it's some, something belonging to the lunatic fringe. Um, and yet the origin of this story is the great Greek philosopher Plato, who tells us that he got the story through his family line. His ancestor Solon, the lawmaker, had been in Egypt and there had been told the story of Atlantis and had been told that Atlantis was destroyed and submerged 9,000 years before his time. And that's since Solon lived in 600 BC. That's 9,600 BC, which is 11 1,600 years ago, which happens to coincide exactly with the second spike of cataclysm that you mentioned uh, in, in your intro to this. There were, there were two cataclysmic events, one 12,800 years ago and a second 11,600 years ago. Both were accompanied by global wildfires and, and, and an enormous flooding. And the, the event 11,600 years ago, particularly massive floods, which are known in the geological record as Meltwater Pulse 1b. And that's the date that coincides exactly with Plato's date for the submergence of Atlantis. So, you know, if he made it up, uh, as he's accused of doing, um, he turns out to have been astonishingly on the money with, uh, with the latest uh, geological science. And, I, you know, we have to 
we have to consider the implications of that and no longer just laugh at the Atlantis tradition. There's a worldwide memory of a lost, advanced civilization. And what type of, I mean, how advanced were they technologically? Were they, we, we hear, you know, from the Vedic traditions, uh, um, we, we hear about flying machines. Robert Oppenheimer talked about, was sort of asked off mic, I guess, about is this the first time in human history that an H-bomb has been detonated? Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, in modern times. And then we have yeah. sand being fused into glass in the Gobi Desert and so forth. Did they so, have nuclear technology? Yeah, well, that's the Brahmastra weapon that's referred to in the, the Vedas and, of course, the Vimanas, the, the ancient Indian flying machines and so on. Look, there's been so much work um, done on this, so much published on on all of this that uh, I feel it's superfluous for me to for me to go into it. I've tried to concentrate on on completely new information in this book and new and, and solidly based scientific information. I'm, I'm here, I'm doing this because I want to overturn the paradigm. The evidence deserves it. I'm, it's not me who's going to overturn the paradigm. I'm simply the messenger. In Magicians of the Gods, I'm putting together the latest scientific evidence that shows that the existing paradigm of history cannot stand. And that evidence up till now has been confined to the rarefied air of scientific journals and very little Little of it has tilted out into the public domain. I think as it does so, uh, we're going to understand that the story we've been given about the past is very, very deeply misleading and we must get to grips with a major forgotten episode in human history, a civilization that could lift and move blocks of stone weighing a thousand tons uh, and more, which could accurately map the world and left us maps that show the world as it looked during the last ice age when sea level was 400 feet lower than it is today. Sea level was 400 feet lower than it is today because all that water was locked up in ice caps sitting on top of North America and Northern Europe. And these ancient maps um, incorporate fantastically accurate longitudes. And that's something our civilization couldn't do until the end of the 18th century or the beginning of the 19th century when accurate marine chronometers were invented. So the maps themselves tell us that during the Ice Age, more than 12,000 years ago, there was a civilization on this planet that explored and mapped the entire Earth uh, and that did so with a level of accuracy and technology that, that, that would not be matched again until the early 19th century uh, of, of our era. Um, there, there, there are also issues like uh, astronomy, incredibly precise astronomy built into ancient monuments, uh, which is work of high precision. Uh, artifacts like the Mayan calendar, which make it possible to predict an eclipse of the moon 200,000 years into the future or 200,000 years into the past. The Mayan calendar has a greater accuracy in the length that it gives us for the solar year than we ourselves use today. All of these are legacies of a great civilization of prehistoric antiquity that for a long while has only been remembered in myths and traditions, but now is coming out into the light again as a result of new scientific discoveries. Uh, when we think about the Bronze Age in Europe and, and you know, wondered where, where did all that copper come from to fuel the Bronze Age? And, and I've yes. been told there's a, this huge copper mining operation on the shores of Lake Superior. Uh, yes, indeed how, there is. And how far back all, was that? all absolutely true. And again, I mean, the recent history, the recent history that you're talking about here, and I regard the Bronze Age as recent history, uh, <laughs> is also being misleadingly told to us. You know, our academics would like us to believe that nobody was crossing the oceans until the time of Columbus. That's an astonishingly Eurocentric position. Um, of course, our ancestors were crossing the oceans. Of course, they were trading across vast networks. Of course, it's not an accident that there's cocaine and nicotine in Bronze Age mummies from, uh, from Egypt, as a matter of fact, uh, because cocaine and nicotine are both uh, New Age plant products, which you don't get in the old world. But all of this evidence is just brushed under the carpet or dismissed by the mainstream because it disturbs their comfortable, um, somehow reassuring view of history. And that's a view of history which is intended, intended to paint us as the apex and the pinnacle of the human story, as though we are what the human story has been all about. 
Uh, whereas, in fact, that's not the case. We're just part of a much longer story, and there have been rises and falls before, and we've lost far more uh, than it's possible to imagine. Uh, I'm just thinking, going back to the you know this mining operation, how large would those vessels have had to have been in order to you know, to ship copper back to Europe to, for, the, for the Bronze Age? I mean... Well, I, I think that's kind of a non-question in a way. I mean, you know, who cares how large the vessels were? You can have, you can have smaller vessels, which, can, which are also capable of crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the, the, the Atlantic Ocean, the ancient Egyptians had ships that were capable of navigating the high seas. There's a, there's a, 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 a ship 130 foot long was buried off the south side of the Great Pyramid uh, in Giza. Uh, recently, uh, you know, dug up and, and reconstructed a beautiful seagoing, ocean, ocean-going vessel. Um, but this is, you know, again, we're looking at revisions of very recent history here. The much more troubling issues, the much deeper problems, the ones that really change our view of the past, take us much further back into the last ice age. I'm not actually even very interested in the period of 1000 BC. We have written records for that period, enormous written records. What's fascinating is to go back to the period where there are no written records at all and where everything we understand about the past is based on very fragmentary evidence, sometimes less than 1% of an archaeological site dug up by archaeologists. How did the uh, the shining ones, the magicians, how did they survive this cataclysm? Well, the traditions that report on this suggest that we're dealing with a maritime seafaring civilization. There's a particular body of texts at the Temple of Horus at Edfu in Upper Egypt called the Edfu Building Texts which describe this whole story in great detail. And they leave us in no doubt that some members of the civilization, which was an island-based civilization that was destroyed in this, this comet-induced cataclysm, the comet, part of the comet actually hit that island, that some members of that civilization were still at sea and far away when the disaster happened, and that they made their way back to their navigated back to their home island uh, and, and found it gone and disappeared beneath the waves and nothing but mud filling the sea where it had stood. And they made it their project. It became their, their mission, their sacred purpose to resurrect or to reconstitute or, if you like, to reincarnate the lost world of the gods. And they set about wandering the world in order to do that. And Egypt certainly was not the only place that they settled. There's an intriguing site in Turkey, a megalithic site on a gigantic scale, 50 times bigger than Stonehenge and 7,000 years older than Stonehenge that has recently been discovered and that I feature heavily in Magicians of the Gods. And the date of this site is also 11,600 years ago. It looks like a transfer of technology. It looks like people who were already master architects and master builders turned up there and taught the local hunter-gatherers, used it, if you like, used this project as a, as a gathering point for initiation into their system of ideas and taught the local hunter-gatherers how to become sedentary, settled people. They taught them agriculture because agriculture suddenly appears in Turkey at this time. They taught them how to make megalithic architecture. And then after they'd run this site for a thousand years, they deliberately buried it. They completely covered it up like a time capsule. In fact, the name Gobekli Tepe in the Turkish language means pot-bellied hill. And the whole hill pot-bellied hill that sits over the top of this site is entirely artificial. They went to enormous lengths to bury it as a time capsule. And it's intriguing and extraordinary that it's only been discovered in our era and the excavations really didn't begin until the second half of the 1990s. And each new turn of the spade reveals more and more astonishing information there. Why would they have covered it up, Graham? For the same reason that we would cover something up and bury it deeply out of human sight uh, to pass a message to the future, uh, to, to send down a time capsule to the future, a completely intact time capsule. That appears to me to have been their intention. We can't absolutely know their intention, you know, because we don't have, we don't have written documents that we can interpret, although there are certainly symbols and signs 
carved on these pillars. We just don't know what they say, uh, but the astronomical indications of the site, and we don't have time tonight to go into this in detail, but I back it up thoroughly in the book. The astronomical indications of the site include a picture carved on a stone pillar, pillar 43 in enclosure D, uh, of the sky in our time today, uh, and of the area of the sky that's divided by the dark rift of the Milky Way at the center of our galaxy. On one side stands the constellation of Sagittarius, and on the other side stands the constellation of Scorpio. And in this image, the sun is sitting absolutely straddling the dark rift of the Milky Way. And that only happens on the winter solstice, the 21st of December, uh, in our epoch, and indeed in a very narrow window between roughly 1960 and 2040. It implies a vast knowledge of astronomy, the ability to calculate the changes in the sky forwards for thousands of years, uh, and an ancient wish to communicate a message to people who live in our time, which is pay attention, pay attention to the sky. All right. In Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, I'm wondering, uh, I mean, are you monitoring the kinds of, I'm, I'm, I'm no doubt you are, the, the, the information uh, coming out of there and, and, and uh, I mean, how closely is it being controlled? What do you hear? What do you know about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm monitoring the inf information very, very closely. Um, I would not say that there is um, a deliberate attempt to hide the truth from us at Gobekli Tepe. I've met the archaeologists working on the site. I had the privilege of being shown around the site for more than three days on my research first, first research visit there by Klaus Schmidt, who was the original discoverer and excavator uh, of the site. And I, I, I uh, unfortunately, he passed away in 2014. And I'm not so sure about the new regime that's taken over there. But he certainly was a very open man. And he showed me everything I want to see. I wanted to see the only thing he said that worried me was that 50 times as much as they've already excavated is still lying under the ground. They've been over the site with ground penetrating radar uh, and they found hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these huge 20 to 50 ton megalithic pillars are lying deeply buried under the ground. Uh, and his position, which I thought was rather odd, was that we're planning to just leave most of them there and not excavate them at all. Um, and if that is the case, it would be, it would be a shocking waste of opportunity uh, to discover the truth about our past. One of the puzzles of Gobekli Tepe, I mentioned to you that it was founded 11,600 years ago and then ran for about another thousand years before being deliberately buried. One of the puzzles about it is that the best stuff is the oldest. The oldest material, the oldest megaliths are towering and gigantic and beautifully executed. But as the thousand years pass, the skills seem to seem to devolve. And I, I think that archaeology is a bit worried about the implications of this, because the only possible explanation can be that that site benefited from a legacy of knowledge, of advanced knowledge, which allowed the best work to be done immediately. Uh, and then as time passed, those skills began to fade away. Uh, are there signatures and similarities between the the design in Gobekli Tepe or in in Sacsayhuaman? Are, are there similarities? I think the big similarities um, that we that we're really going to observe uh, and and are going to require us to redate a number of megalithic sites are, for example, between Gobekli Tepe and the T-shaped megaliths of Menorca in the Balearic Islands in the Western Mediterranean. Those megaliths in Menorca are only thought to be about 4,000 years old. But you see, archaeologists can't directly date the cutting of stone. They have to date organic material found in association with the stone. And so many megalithic sites have been exposed to the element, trampled over by later cultures. Falsely young organic material has been introduced, giving falsely young dates. I think we're going to have to reconsider the dates of many sites. The megalithic temples of Malta in the Mediterranean are also deeply puzzling, massive, extraordinary temples, so-called temples. And, and um, they're thought to be about five or five and a half thousand years old. But again, they look very like Gobekli Tepe as well, which we know is eleven and a half thousand years old. And the big one, of course, is the Great Sphinx of Giza. 
um, which, uh, as I'm sure you and your listeners know, has been the subject of a controversy since the early 1990s when my friends and colleagues, John Anthony West and Professor Robert Schock, Professor of Geology at Boston University, made the case that the Great Sphinx did not date to 2500 BC, 4,500 years ago, the time of the Pharaohs, but that it's thousands of years older, going back to about 12,000 years ago. And at the time, Egyptologists dismissed their arguments and said this couldn't be so if there was a culture in the world more than 12,000 years ago that was create, capable of creating something on a monumental scale like the Great Sphinx, a massive megalithic site like that, why we would find other very ancient megalithic sites. Well, you see, they could get away with saying that in 1992, but now that we've got this groundbreaking discovery of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, and by the way, there's another site in Indonesia that also dates back to the same period that's recently been discovered, that argument no longer holds. The Great Sphinx makes perfect sense. There was a culture in the world more than 12,000 years ago that was capable of creating structures like this, of moving blocks in the case of Gobekli Tepe weighing up to 50 tons, in the case of the Sphinx and the megalithic temples in front of the Sphinx, 100 tons or more, and then go over to Baalbek in the Lebanon and look at the gigantic freestanding megalithic wall that surrounds the Roman temple of Jupiter there. There is a Roman temple there, and this is what's caused problems in uh, understanding this site, but the megalithic wall is far older, and that's where, where we find blocks of 900 tons each. I mean, when I first saw these things, I was just stunned. I can't imagine. 30 feet above the ground, blocks of stone 60 feet long. You know, they've been moved around as though they were, as though they were featherweight, and, and the evidence is, is accumulating. I think it's reached the point of being irrefutable now. Well, it'll be interesting to see how they... The how... work of an advanced civilization. It'll be in interesting to see how they continue to spin this to sort of keep a lid on things because, you know, there is tenure at stake in many cases. All right. Welcome back uh, to The Conspiracy Show. Graham Hancock is uh, with me and coming to town Sunday, December the 13th. It is sold out. The Bloor Cinema, absolutely, completely sold out. However, I have got a pair of tickets, uh, one pair of tickets uh, to give away to one lucky caller. Uh, question or comment here in the last segment for Graham Hancock, Magicians of the Gods. Uh, before we get to the uh, the comet and whether or not it's headed back our way, I want to ask you, uh, this is a story posted on your, your website, GrahamHancock.com, and uh, mm -hmm. we're hearing a lot about this these, these days. Is The um, Egyptian officials say there is now a 90% chance, they are 90% sure, rather, there is a hidden chamber in King Tutankhamun's tomb. Mm -hmm. uh, what can you tell us about that, and, and what does that have to do with, perhaps, what you're talking about in Magicians of the Gods? Well, again, Richard, you keep bringing me back to recent history. King Tutankhamun's tomb, and whether there's a hidden chamber in it or not, uh, is not going to change history. Tutankhamun's tomb is from the time of about 1200 before Christ. It's really recent history. We have thorough documentation for that period, and we have a pretty good idea, not a complete idea, but a pretty good idea what was going to go, what was going on. And we're not going to find anything there that's going to completely turn our view of the world around. I, I'm, I'm quite sure that the, the work is correct, that there is a, a, a concealed chamber, and we will find more grave goods uh, connected to the burial of Tutankhamun in there. Actually, much more interesting is the, the, the recent uh, evidence with thermal imaging surveys over the Great Pyramid of multiple uh, hidden chambers inside the Great Pyramid of Giza. Now, that has the potential to rewrite history because the date of the Great Pyramid of Giza, which Egyptologists like to place at 2500 BC, is actually very uncertain. There are no inscriptions at all on the Great Pyramid that really tie it down to that date. And there are many indications that it may be much, much older, that parts of it may be 12,000 years old, as old as the Sphinx. And there are traditions, ancient Egyptian traditions, of a, an archive of wisdom laid down before the flood. This is stated quite specifically, having been hidden away in chambers inside the Great Pyramid. So, you know, the, the, the thermal imaging and the ground penetrating radar technology that show up these chambers are, yeah, great, it's, a, it's gonna be a fun story, it'll live for two or three days about Tutankhamun, but it's not gonna change the world. 
what's being found in the Great Pyramid, the possibility of a network of hidden chambers and passageways in the Great Pyramid, that very well could change the world. Do you think one day, uh, well, this is speculation, but it, I mean, is there a library that would that, that dates back 12,000 years or older that would rival the Library of Alexandria? Many ancient traditions point to this, and not just one library, but several. Uh, another site that I report on extensively in Magicians of the Gods is a newly discovered pyramid site in Indonesia, dating back close to 20,000 years. And again, mysteriously, the archaeological work has been stopped there. And the electro electrical resistivity and ground penetrating radar surveys inside that pyramid th show three huge chambers within there. Uh, and this is, this is an area, Indonesia, that was massively affected by flooding uh, at the end of the Ice Age. So I think there are many parts of the world where hidden archives have been uh, concealed, and we are poised on the edge, I hope, of rediscovering them. All right, let's uh, go out to Scarborough. Wayne has a question or a comment for Graham Hancock. Wayne, good morning. Go ahead. Yes, good morning, Richard. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to uh, ask a question. Um, these ancients, it's all very interesting. Do, uh, does he suppose that they had computer knowledge also? Uh, you know, uh, referring to their atomic power possibly. And if I'd just like to comment from the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, is there anything new under the sun which one can say, look, this is something new. It has been here already long ago. It was here before our time. Sure. Um, this, is, uh, this is a fair question. Um, I think when we look at a lost ancient civilization that flourished between 70,000 years ago and 11,600 years ago, we're looking at a civilization that in many way, ways was very different from our own. I've gone down the route of mechanical advantage with our technology, and we're very, very good at that, no, no doubt about it. Uh, but I think that faculties of the of the human mind the 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 power of the human mind with issues like telekinesis for example for which there's plenty of evidence um, may have been much more highly developed in a civilization like that so so tasks that that we would regard as difficult which we would perform with cranes and huge lifting machines uh, may have been done much more easily in the past. There are also traditions of huge blocks of stone being sung into place using music and sound to lift them off the ground rather than the mechanical means that, that we use. So there, there are many echoes like this. And did they have computers? I, I would suggest that their minds had uh, extraordinary computing power. Again and again, both the strength and the weakness of our civilization is to devolve all of these tasks onto machines rather than harnessing the full power of the human brain. All right. Uh, thank you for that, Wayne. Thank you. Um, the message that is encoded in places like Gobekli Tepe and the Sphinx and the pyramids of Egypt, warning about the great return that will occur in our time, the great return of this comet. Tell me uh, a little bit more about that. if you Well, can. actually, the comet returns twice a year. We pass through its debris trail twice a year, and this is not only a matter of ancient texts, this is a matter of very recent science and very recent astronomy, again reported and documented fully in Magicians of the Gods. The debris trail of the comet that we pass through twice a year is called the Torrid Meteor Stream. It takes the Earth 12 days to pass through it at the end of June, and another day, 12 days to pass through it again in November, and we've just been through the Torrid Meteor Stream. Now, most of the time, we just get meteors, you know, shooting stars, nothing, nothing very big or, or dangerous. The last significant impact from the Torrid Meteor Stream was in 1908. It was the Tunguska event, which flattened 80 million trees, fortunately, in an uninhabited area of Siberia. But the evidence is that a giant comet that was at least 100 kilometers in diameter, broke up into multiple parts as comets do. Everybody can remember Shoemaker Levy 9 breaking into multiple parts and hitting Jupiter in 1996. This comet broke into multiple parts. Several of those fragments, some of them up to a mile wide, hit the Earth 12,800 years ago. The principal impacts were on the North American ice cap, 
they unleashed a global flood. Further fragments hit the earth 11,600 years ago. Those impacts were in water. They put a cloud of water vapor into the upper atmosphere and rapidly heated the earth up because previously it had gone very cold. There were indeed additional impacts during the Bronze Age. The most recent impact was in 1908, and the astronomical evidence, very powerful mathematical calculations as well, is that there are a number of large bits of that original comet still orbiting in the Taurid meteor stream, one of them as much as 30 kilometers in diameter, that there are 100 asteroids in the Taurid meteor stream, which are more than a kilometer in diameter, each one of them on its own capable of causing cataclysm on Earth, and that we should be paying attention to this. It's not a message of doom and gloom. We have the technology to sweep our cosmic environment clean and to make life on Earth safe and ensure we're not the next lost civilization. But the powers that be, don't want us to do that. They want to pull the wool over the, our eyes. Maybe they have some depopulation goal uh, in mind. Who knows? I, I find the way that this story is being covered up, and it's one of the reasons I've written Magicians of the Gods. The way this story is being covered up is one of the most disturbing aspects of it. Well, there have been a number of uh, astronomers, you know, every every sort of theory has its death list, but and this one is no different, really. There have been a number of astronomers that have supposedly met with uh, mysterious uh, circumstances, died under mysterious yeah. circumstances. Is that related to this cover up? Do you suppose? Uh, quite possibly, it is. Yeah, yeah. NASA does not want this story to get out. There's been a huge effort to to persuade us that uh, nothing, uh, that there's no real danger. Um, but major, major figures like like the late, actually the late Sir Fred Hoyle, um, a leading British astronomer who who taught at the University of Cambridge, Chandra Wickram Singh, um, uh, Victor Klub, Bill Napier, uh, all of whose work I document in, in the new book are, are deeply concerned about the Torrid meteor stream and, and have continued to publish and continue to be ignored. But now that their evidence can be triangulated with evidence from Earth sciences of the comet impacts 12,800 and 11,600 years ago that completely changed the world, changed the world utterly and ushered in a new story. Now that we have all that information together, it's harder to resist the case that the astronomers make. Well, Graham, uh, fascinating, fascinating as always. And uh, again, people will, uh, will be very anxious to hear and see your presentation at the Bloor Cinema Sunday, December the 13th. Uh, incidentally, we did get a, a pair of tickets, uh, a gentleman named Rudy calling in, and uh, he is our lucky winner, and uh, Rudy will receive instructions on how to pick these up here at the radio station. Well, I look forward to seeing Rudy there, <laughs> and I'll right. be giving a, a detailed presentation.